The Islanders meet the Chicago Blackhawks tonight in Chicago. We have a special crossover episode with Jack Bushman of Locked On Blackhawks to preview this game in depth and tell you where both teams stand after nine games. All that and more coming up on this special crossover edition of the Locked On Islanders podcast. Your Locked On Islanders, your daily podcast on the New York Islanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another episode of Locked On Blackhawks and Locked On Islanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Just quickly wanted to say thank you to everyone out there for making both shows your first listen here to start off your day. And a reminder that you can find both Lockdown Blackhawks and Lockdown Islanders 100% for free on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Jack Bushman, joined today by Gil Martin, host of Lockdown Islanders, ahead of the matchup on Tuesday night at the United Center between these two teams. Gil, always fun to get together for a chat, man. How you doing? How's the start of the season treating you? I'm good. You know, it's been a little up and down for the Islanders, but a nice three-game winning streak coming into tonight's game. So uh, looking up as of late, happy about that. How about you? I'm doing well. It's been definitely a better start than I imagined for my Chicago Blackhawks. They've been playing a lot of competitive hockey through their first nine games, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later. So all all smiles on my face thus far. So uh, glad to hear that the start of the season seems to be treating both of us well. And you referenced the New York Islanders have started to pick it up here these last couple of games. And that's where I wanted to start this conversation today, Gil. Uh, they get off to a little bit of a slow start, two and four through their first six games, but now three really impressive wins in a row here against uh, the Avs, the Hurricanes, and the Rangers, correct? Yeah. Right. Three pretty meaningful wins right there to kind of get the ball rolling in the right direction. Can you kind of tell me in those first six games, what kind of went wrong and what's kind of translated to success here in their past few outings? I think part of it is that, you know, Lane Lambert was still looking for good line combinations and hadn't really settled on them, trying to maximize the talent of Matthew Barzal and you know, Barzi is a great skater and a great passer, but he's not a shoot first kind of a guy. So it, it's a little tough to find the right line mates, a guy who can both shoot well and keep up with them and not, you know, get lost when he starts taking off and circling around with the puck. So uh, there was that. And then I think Lane Lambert, you know, this is his first head coaching gig in the NHL. And I think he's sort of making his adjustments. The players are adjusting to him. They found better line combinations and they found sort of that sweet spot in between the Barry Trotz really conservative defense first system and Lane Lambert wanting them to open it up a little bit, but not too much. So I think player and uh, like the players and the coach are kind of getting on the same page after the first nine games now. And that's something I wanted to ask you about, too, was, you know, Lane Lambert, obviously, in his first year here in New York, uh, we actually chatted in the offseason with Barry Trotz being available, and there were some rumors that possibly he could go to Chicago. Obviously, we know now that they went differently, but uh, obviously, it's, you know, a new era in New York with Lane Lambert now behind the bench, and um, I was kind of looking at some of the statistical numbers for the Islanders here to start the season and still really good defensively from what I've noticed first on the PK right now, uh, six in the NHL in goals allowed per game. So still having that defensive success that they were having under Barry Trotz, but I've noticed they're also ranked fourth in the NHL right now in goals per game, which is obviously a bit of a change from what we've seen in the past few years uh, with this team. Do you kind of credit that to, uh, the difference in the styles in those two coaches and also all in all, uh, what have you thought of Lambert's style or structure offensively this season? I, I do give Lambert a lot of credit. You know, he's sort of encouraging the players, especially the defensemen, to take calculated gambles as to when they step up into the play. And he's encouraging them to do that, but doesn't want them to get caught. And yet, you know, here we are nine games into the season. Scott Mayfield has three goals already. 
uh, which is, you know, not what you typically would expect from him. Uh, Noah Dobson has three goals. They're also, you know, Ryan Pulak has five points, a goal and four assists. So you're seeing some of these defensemen just getting more involved in the offense and and sort of figuring out when they can do it without getting caught and and creating odd man rushes the other way. And they are sort of finding that sweet spot right now, and that definitely has been a part of it. Now, you referenced that it, it kind of took a few games to get the line combination sorted out and kind of figure out where everyone needs to be. What are the forward line combinations that us Blackhawks fans can be looking for tonight uh, in this matchup? Well, Matthew Barzal still centering the top line with Josh Bailey and Oliver Wallstrom. And, and you know, Wallstrom had trouble getting into the lineup full time last year under Barry Trotz. Trotz was always sort of hesitant to trust younger players. He's gotten a little bit more latitude so far from Lane Lambert. Teaming Brock Nelson, Anders Lee, and Anthony Bavillier on the second line. And then the 3P line, J.G. Pajot, Zach Parise, and Kyle Palmieri as your third line. And the identity line, the Islanders' famous fourth line of Casey Sezikis, Matt Martin, and Cal Clutterbuck. They'll get out there and, and forecheck and bang you know bodies out there and just really do a a good job of setting the tone physically. That's one of those lines that I feel like it's like, I don't know if you're a college basketball fan, but it's like, it feels like Aaron Kraft when he was playing for Ohio state, he was there for six years. It feels like this fourth line of the Islanders has been there for an eternity. It's just like a new year, same fourth line, still doing the same things. They, are they off to an effective start so far? They are. And, you know, last year, all these guys are on the wrong side of 30. Last year, there was some speculation. Maybe they're slowing down. Their bodies are breaking down. And injuries definitely affected them. But this year, they have been uh, sharper and, and much more effective. It's almost like they, they, they got a little faster and, and got a little bit more cohesive. And maybe just being healthy is part of that. Yeah, I mean, especially when you get guys that are up into the 30s, uh, it's difficult to be healthy, but you really kind of need that almost to be effective or try to stay healthy as long as possible, right? Uh, and that's the difficulty with playing such a physical game for so long and why you always got to tip your hat to those older, older guys who are uh, able to stick around for so long in today's game. Uh, last question I had for you, Gil, is about Matt Barzell. He obviously signed the big deal not all that long ago, an eight-year contract with the Islanders. Uh, I noticed that he doesn't have a goal yet on the season, but he does still lead the Islanders in points with 10 assists. Uh, I'm curious, what do you kind of think about that deal and the numbers behind it? And also, how do you think it, has Barzell responded to that early on in the season? I, I think the deal was a good one, but in order to make it work, over the long haul, I think both Matthew Barzal and the Islanders have to do a little bit more than they had in the past. I think, you know, the deal doesn't actually kick in until next season. He's still playing on the last year of that old bridge deal that he signed three, three years ago. Um, but realistically, over the long haul, if they want to make this deal work, the Islanders are going to have to get him a sniper, a 30 plus goal guy to play with him to maximize his potential and his effectiveness as a playmaker. And on the flip side, Barzal has to shoot a little bit more and, and sort of integrate himself into the offense. You know, the, the, the skating and stopping on a dime is great, but if it results in a turnover and an odd man rush the other way, that's not helping your team. So uh, I, I think both sides need to do a little more over the long run to make it work. But you know, 10 points in the first nine games, and even if they are all assists, Barzal is not taking his foot off the gas after signing the big money, and that's very encouraging if you're an Islanders fan. Well, Gil, thank you so much for that insight on the Islanders ahead of this matchup. Coming up in just a moment, I will turn it over to you for some questions on the Chicago Blackhawks. But first, I got to tell all you listeners out there about Simply Safe. And the numbers don't lie. In the last decade, over 4 million people have chosen Simply Safe home security to protect their home. And you don't earn the trust of that many people without doing something right. 
At Simply Safe, your safety is the only thing that matters, and they protect you with the best cutting edge security technology powered by 24 7 professional monitoring agents that always have your back. And here's why I love it Simply Safe blankets your home with the best protection. They have advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, along with HD security cameras for inside and outside your home, along with hazard sensors that instantly detect fires, floods, and other threats. And you can also customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes when, when you visit simplysafe.com slash lockdown NHL and save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and you can get your first month for free. All you have to do is visit simplysafe.com slash lockdown NHL to learn more. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right, back here for segment two. Real quick, just want to say thanks again to everyone out there for making Lockdown Blackhawks and Lockdown Islanders your first listen today. But now, be sure to go and make your second listen, Game to Game NHL. Every moment, every top performance, and every result. Lockdown Game to Game covers every game across the NHL with local analysis that only Lockdown can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Lockdown NHL, which is available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, segment two, turning it over to Gil now to ask some questions about the Chicago Blackhawks. Take it away, my friend. Well, I mean, you've got to be pleased with the the four, three, and two start and the and the Blackhawks being, as you mentioned at the top, competitive in nearly every game. The the thing I like about this lineup is the mix of veterans and younger players. Talk to me about how that's meshing and and why do you think this team is a little bit ahead of where most people thought they'd be in the first nine games of this season? Yeah, it really is kind of an interesting breakdown of the roster. And I've talked about this with a few of the Blackhawks media folks, but there's like the guys who are like 28 and older that probably don't have anything to do with the future. Then there's a couple young guys who are still here and then also a handful of guys that are trying to prove themselves and cement themselves as NHLers. So it's a really interesting bunch, but you know what? I think it's been a a group that's really worked hard and enjoyed themselves together. Like that chemistry that they all have in such a short time has been absolutely noticeable. And we just saw it actually uh, on Sunday night against the Minnesota wild Max Domi and Patrick Kane have been teammates for nine games. And you would have thought, Max Domi and Patrick Kane have been line mates for 20 years the way he went after Tyson Jost for taking a run at Patrick Kane, but uh, they're just having a lot of fun together. And one thing I do have to give a lot of credit to uh, is Kyle is general manager, Kyle Davidson for mixing and matching this team with a lot of, a lot of the veteran guys that he's brought in or older guys, as I referenced may not be part of the rebuild, a lot of those guys are good two-way players and particularly solid on the defensive side of things who, yeah, maybe they're not the most productive, but it's the right type of guys that these young players want to learn from impacting the game in different ways rather than only, you know, the points that you put up. And we see a guy like Sam Lafferty, who's not a household name in the NHL by any means. And he's really broken onto the scene here and nightly, whether it's, being physical on the four check, or as we've seen offensively putting up some good numbers here, he's finding ways to make an impact. Jason Dickinson, someone Kyle Davidson just acquired from Vancouver. He's really come on strong and been an awesome third line center. Jonathan Taves is looking as good as he's, as he's been since uh, he was forced to miss that entire season. And you know what? A lot of the credit too has to go to the Blackhawks netminders like Alex Stalock is kind of being leaned on as the starter with Peter Morazic on IR and Stalock hasn't played a whole lot of hockey the last two years. He was forced to miss an entire season as well. And basically each and every one of his starts, I've thought he's made every save that he was supposed to. And then some, and that's quietly been a, a sneaky theme for the Blackhawks this year. The goaltending has been better than expected. And when you get good goaltending, you have a shot to stay in some games that maybe you don't deserve to be in. So it's not like the Blackhawks are, are playing perfect hockey or anything, Gil. It's just, it, it feels like in every game, something is picking up the lacking area, right? Like if, the penalty kill struggling, we're getting really good goaltending or, or something along those lines. It just feels like the effort and the intensity and the willingness to compete. It, it's been awesome to see thus far, man. And 
Um, if the Blackhawks continue to play like that, I, I think it's going to make this season a whole lot easier to swallow, even if the final outcome isn't always wins. Yeah, it, it looks like this team is doing well. And, and you know, the Blackhawks, as you mentioned, also have a new coach. How has Luke Richardson helped this team's success early on this year? Oh, it, it feels <laughs> like it's been a world difference, Gil. It's, it's having people wonder what last year's team could have done under Luke Richardson's leadership. Because you look at the Blackhawks roster on opening day last year, you just added Seth Jones, you get a legit number one goaltender and Mark Andre Fleury added Jake McCabe, obviously getting Jonathan Taves back. They still had to brink it at that time. And Kubalik, it looked like a team that, you know, could have potentially competed for a spot in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And Jeremy Colleton and the system that he ran, it, it just it was a failure right from the get-go. The Blackhawks were behind the eight ball. They won one of their first 12 games and didn't really stand a chance from the rest of the way. But Luke Richardson has come in and it feels like it's been night and day. The guys really seem like they're enjoying themselves. The penalty kill, even though it is ranked in the bottom third of the NHL right now, that's really only due to two games against the Edmonton Oilers and the Colorado Avalanche. Guess what? Their power plays are going to light it up when you give them opportunities. Mm -hmm. Against everyone else, the Blackhawks PK has been really good. Uh, and, and I already mentioned it earlier, the effort level. It's been there every game, and especially late in games too. Earlier, uh, Early on in the season, the Blackhawks are have lost their last three games, but prior to that, they had won four in a row. In all of those games, they won the third period in order to seal the deal and get those two points. So it, it's it's been really awesome to see how this team has reacted to Luke Richardson. It, it feels like he's pushed all the right buttons and the players are having fun and they're also working hard and doing the right things. And that's a really good combination that uh, we haven't said it in quite some time here in Chicago. So everyone seems to be loving everything about Luke Richardson. Obviously it's still early. So uh, the jury's still out a little bit, but I really don't have any complaint at all about the way that he's handled this team so far, Gil. I've been really, really thrilled with it. Does the team's relative success early on possibly change the equation that so many people are talking about that veterans like Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves may not be here after the trade deadline? It's definitely uh, an intriguing thought. And it was a conversation I just had on uh, another crossover recently. It's all guesswork at this point. We haven't heard anything from Taves and Kane in, in quite some time. And I doubt that we will until it actually happens, until the trade deadline really starts closing in and the Blackhawks are going to have to make a decision. But you never know. I mean, I still personally think it's more likely that they get dealt than not, but maybe they enjoy Luke Richardson so much that it changes their mind a little bit and they see, Hey, now we possibly might have the right head coach here and the prospect pool is starting to look enticing. And we're not even really trying to compete this year. And here we are at four, three and two, you know, it, maybe it, it has Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves wondering, okay, maybe this rebuild won't take as long as we think. And maybe the future is brighter than some had hoped. Um, but it's still going to be tough. I think uh, I feel like they're just at that age where even though Patrick Kane is still producing and better than ever, almost, it, it still feels like they're going to realize that there's not that many opportunities left to go and get that Stanley cup. And I, I feel like that opportunity is just going to trump anything, everything at the end of the day. But again, I'm just completely guessing here. We haven't heard anything actually from Taves or Kane to suggest they're leaning one way or the other. Uh, but the one thing I will say that I'm happy about, the only thing I'm happy about with this situation is that the Blackhawks are going to do these two right. They're not going to, it sounds like they're not going to go and make any trades. They're going to let the players kind of decide what's going to happen. They're not going to force their hands or anything. They're going to do and accept whatever Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taves feel is best for their futures. And that's what they deserve after everything they've done for this organization. So we're just going to have to wait and see, Gil. Um, I'm sure everyone's just as anxious as I am, but uh, no real updates on this scenario, unfortunately. And I noticed the Blackhawks have the most penalty minutes in the league as of this time. Is that a concern for you, or is it just sort of a couple of little incidences that really don't add up to much? Oh, I'm definitely concerned because it, it hasn't just been one or two games. There was a – they had – Guild, the craziest game I've genuinely ever been to in my entire life last Thursday against the Edmonton Oilers. There were 17 power plays in that game. 
17. It, it, I had never seen anything like it. Connor McDavid had a hat trick. I was 10 rows off the glass and it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. That's neither here nor there, but it, it seems like it's been every night. The Blackhawks are taking four five, six penalties. And it's like, listen, I know we have four shorthanded goals this year, but come on, let's, let's stay out of the penalty box. I don't know what it's been. And the, the tough thing about it too, it, it's been defensemen that they rely on to kill penalties. Connor Murphy feels like is taking a penalty every night. Um, that that's really just what the killer has been too. guys. They need out there on the PK are going into the penalty box. And look, I don't care how good your penalty kill is doing. You, you can't take five penalties a night and expect that to be a sustainable process. And the Blackhawks really haven't done a good job of helping themselves out here for the majority of the season. So yeah, I've been talking. It's been one of my keys to victory for the last few games. Please stay out of the penalty box. Like, this is not a team that's built for success when you're shorthanded. I mean, it's working now, but I don't think that's going to carry on. So I, I definitely would like to see the Blackhawks limit themselves to two or three at the most tonight. Well, yeah, and, and the Islanders power play still struggling, but uh, there's enough talent there that they could, you know, get going and getting four or five chances would certainly help in that regard. Gil, you play with fire long enough you're going to get burned. And exactly. The Blackhawks exactly. need to not do that. I'm not going to include it in one of my keys to victory, though, since we've already emphasized it. But okay. speaking of key to, keys to victory, you ready to get into our third and final segment here of this crossover? Absolutely. All right, let's get into some predictions and keys to victory for this matchup. Again, between the Blackhawks and the Islanders tonight at the United Center, 7.30 p.m. puck drop. I believe I'll be in attendance again, Gil, so... Well, we'll see. It's looking like I'll be there. Uh, keep my fingers crossed. Blackhawks are 0-1, though, when I've been at the UC, so maybe I'm the curse. Anyways, <laughs> what do you have as your three, or just a couple, I'm not putting you on the spot. If you have any keys to victory for the New York Islanders, uh, what do you think those are, and what is your prediction as to a final outcome tonight? Well, uh, keys to victory for the Islanders, is it always starts with goaltending. And I, it'll probably be Ilya Sorokin for the Islanders. He has played some outstanding hockey, uh, you know, did a great job shutting out the Rangers, made 41 saves to get the shutout uh, late last week. So that was a, a big emotional win that helped turn the team around. Then comes back and plays extremely strong hockey against the Carolina Hurricanes down in Raleigh. So, you know, some tough opponents with some very good players and, and, he was on top of his game. And I think that, you know, the Islanders generally get outshot in most of their games, but they rely on the goaltender to come up with a few key big saves on those few occasions when they do have a breakdown or a turnover and a quality scoring chance is given up. Usually the Islanders will get outshot, but out of, let's say, 35, 36 shots they allow, Two or three of them are really dangerous, and the rest of them, the goalie can see, and there's not a lot of rebounds. Strong game by Sorokin and limit those high-quality chances. Those are always the two biggest keys for the New York Islanders, and then it's just a question of timely scoring. And, you know, when I say limiting those chances, one key to that, slow down some of those faster Chicago Blackhawks forwards in the neutral zone. Don't let them come into your zone with a burst of speed where they can be creative and create, you know, high quality scoring chances that get you into trouble. How about your keys? For me, I, I think one of my biggest keys for the Blackhawks is for their third pairing. I expect it uh, again tonight to be two youngsters, Caleb Jones and Philip Ruse. And the Blackhawks are currently without Seth Jones, their anchor back there for the next three to four weeks due to a right thumb injury. And I'll tell you what, Gil, this defensive group didn't look very good on paper with Seth Jones. Now they're really going to be tested without him. I mean, last game they, they had Jack Johnson as their leading ice time, as their guy who led them in ice time with over 24 minutes. I don't know if that's going to be sustainable. I really think this is going to be a committee approach as long as Seth Jones is going to be out. We're going to see all three of these pairings probably right between the 17 to 22 minute mark because they just don't have that pairing that they can kind of lean on right now. And I think it's really key that Caleb Jones and Philip Ruse don't be weak spots on the defense in a game like this. Don't force Luke Richardson's hand even more than it's already forced because if he has to rely on just the top four, 
those guys are going to be absolutely gassed out there taking extra shifts and that's going to be tough for the Blackhawks defense as a whole so I think that third pairing having another good night is really key and Philip Roos, who's a rookie this year, has looked really good so far. So hoping to see more of that consistency out of him. And then also for the Blackhawks defense, a lot of their issues and a lot of their goals that they've been giving up have come right in front of their goaltender. They just have not done a good enough job boxing out, getting guys, clearing it out. And and they've been losing some battles there and it's really cost them. So I think if they could just play sturdier and more physical, they don't really have a ton of size on that back end other than Connor Murphy and Jared Tenorti, but they're going to need guys to be playing their hearts out and battling it out because their goaltenders have been saving. As I mentioned earlier, their goaltenders have been doing their jobs. It's just, they can't stop everything, especially those little tap-ins when uh, guys aren't being cleared out. So I think that's really key for the Blackhawks defense to limit the amount of chances or rebound chances that guys are going to get in front. And then also keep the power play going. It's been awesome. The Blackhawks haven't had a power play this good. Uh, It's nine games, but feels like since they had Artemi Panarin here, it's been a long time since we've seen the Blackhawks man advantage, keep clicking. And the best part about it, Gil, is we've seen the second unit finally start chipping in for some goals rather than just Patrick Kane doing everything. We're actually seeing some other guys getting involved. So that's been great to see the longer that we can keep those two power play units, both clicking, the more it's just going to help this team because while they've been getting a lot of goals to open up the season, I don't know if that's going to be a consistent theme throughout the year. I've been pleasantly surprised with the offensive output that they've had thus far. I don't know if that's going to be a constant theme, especially when you go up against a strong defensive team like the Islanders. So take advantage of those power play opportunities that you get. Those are my three keys for the Blackhawks. Gil, what do you have as your final prediction for this matchup? Uh, okay. Before we get to that, just wanted to give Bobby. you two, I'm going to give you two names as far as those battles in front of the goal, Anders Lee, Zach Parise. Those are the two guys you're going to have to probably worry about the most. And then with regard to the Blackhawks power play, the Islanders penalty kill gave up their first goal of the year against the avalanche on Saturday. They've only allowed one in nine games. So that is going to be strength against strength and it should be a great matchup to watch. My prediction, this is going to be a tight game. I think both of these teams are headed in the right direction right now, but I think the Islanders will find a way to get it done. I'm saying four to two Islanders with an empty net goal being the the fourth goal for them. How about you? Yeah, it's kind of crazy because just a year ago, I would not have predicted this to be uh, the five to three final that I'm going with right now. I think the Islanders are going to win this one five to three. Um, both these teams, obviously I mentioned earlier, the Islanders fourth in goals per game right now, the Blackhawks have been hitting the over a lot recently. Again, didn't expect the offense to be putting up this many goals. I think that is going to stay a a common theme, even though against the Islanders, I I may not expect it to be this high scoring, but I'm going to go five, three Islanders. They're a hot team right now. They've picked up some really impressive wins. I do think the Blackhawks have the capability to hang with them. And that's kind of the biggest thing is if the Blackhawks can hang, they can stay competitive. The end result, it's going to be what it's going to be. We know the losses are going to happen this year, just kind of how it goes, but it's more so the effort level and the compete level. And I think they have the ability to do that once again here tonight. So I think it's going to be close coming down to the end, but I'm going five to three Islanders. Uh, should be a good one, though, Gil. Uh, yes. I'm really excited for it. Uh, the Blackhawks and the Islanders, this is their first of two meetings here in the next month. I believe the matchup in New York will be on December 4th. But as always, Gil, it's fun when we get together to do these crossovers. I really appreciate you coming on. And we already talked before the show that when these teams do meet again in one month, that we can roll another one of these out. So definitely look looking forward to that, buddy. And uh, thank you again for coming on the show. I really appreciate you. Jack, always a pleasure to do these with you and, and good luck tonight. Gil Martin from Lockdown Islanders, everyone. Once again, thank you to all the listeners out there. If you haven't done so already, make sure to go and show some support for both of our shows, Lockdown Blackhawks, Lockdown Islanders. You can find it on wherever you get your podcasts, 100% for free, and on YouTube, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day.